All right, hey, what's up, guys? This is Clint with Baseball Notes, and uh, here today with uh, Mr. Lanny Basham. Lanny, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, good deal. I was uh, reading his book. I found this book online here uh, the, uh, with Winning in Mind, just fantastic book, and I saw that he was in Flower Mound, and I'm in Keller. For you guys don't know, that's only about you know 30 minutes away, so I'm like, all right, I got to meet this guy in person, so appreciate you taking the time to go all over this here, mm -hmm. so. Um, anyway, uh, so much I want to cover on this. I know we're not going to be able to, to get all of it, but um, I guess first, can you kind of tell us a little bit about your background on how you got started with yeah, I was, know, mental I was, training? I was the worst baseball player on my, in my in my in my <laughs> state. Okay. Okay. All right. I mean, I was I mean, that was like any any kid. You know, you want to get you want to you want to play games, and and so uh, my problem was I was slow, short, and uncoordinated. That's why I played alternate right field in Little League. Okay, I got yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. Other than that, so, you were fine, I guess. Uh, I was pretty devastated that I couldn't I couldn't even get up to, to the second alternate, you know. Uh, right. The alternate might get I could get to play. <laughs> but no, no, no. Man. So I was a pretty bad athlete. I was in sixth grade. We were studying in Wilkinson School. And the teacher asked me the asked the class a question. So I made the statement that, in class, he said, you know, it's possible somebody in this class could be an Olympic champion someday. I wonder if you have the best chance. And this little kid sat next to me, jumps right up and says, teacher, I don't know how to have the best chance, but I know for sure you have the worst chance landing. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that was kind of a turning point in my life. That and really, he oh, really yeah, said that. I, I really? really? What a moment. What we have. Yeah. And, and so I come home all, all up to that. Uh -huh. And uh, I told my dad, my dad was a military officer, kind of a World War II war hero kind of guy. And uh, uh, he told me, well, you have a kind of thing you've got to you know, so keep, keep looking. And uh, my mother um, took another taxi, headed me to the library, and checked out books on Olympians. She says, we need to find out what Olympians, who they really are. Right. And uh, so I started reading the, book, the books and I found out that, uh, you know, they're, they had massive challenges. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, so were they. Uh, and so I thought, well, I have that in common with them, you know, I can't. And, but I, I got it. I started becoming extremely interested in the Olympics and how that, that happened. And it wasn't long after that, a friend of mine invited me to a rifle club meeting. I didn't have any idea what that was about. And I said, well, tell me about rifle shooting. He said, well, it's an Olympic sport. And I said, are you sure? Uh -huh. you know, <laughs> because I wasn't finding any books at the library about uh, looking right. rifle shooters. I, I was reading Jesse Owens and yeah. Wilma Rudolph and people like that. And so um, uh, he said, oh, yeah, it's Olympic sports, been in the Olympics since the modern Olympiad. And, and uh, uh, so I said, well, tell me, how tall do you have to be to be a rifle shooter? He said, well, it doesn't matter how tall you are. Right. I said, okay, how strong do you have to be? Said, the rifles aren't that heavy. I said, how fast do you have to be? He said, you don't understand to be the best shooter in the world. All you got to do is stand still. I said, good. I've had a lot of practice out there in right field, man. Uh -huh. I, I was sitting in the bench, you know, I was sitting on the bench because uh, I got a chance to, to, to compete in a sport that, um, you know, a lot of kids just don't have the body type to play football, baseball, basketball, you know? Right. And so um, rifle shooting was, uh, was a way that I could, I could do it. So I got interested in it and um, I went to the university, had a shooting sports program. UTA had a real fine shooting team. Uh, at the time, I was on a high school rifle team. See, back when I went to high school, uh, we, had a, we had a million uh, high school students shooting rifles every day in schools. That's really? Right. That's right. No kidding. A million. And about a half a million collegiate athletes going to school every, every day shooting rifles every day. Uh, today, not so much, but uh, uh, I went to a school, had a, sh a good, good team, um, and uh, I managed to win a junior national championship um, as a four-year All-American at UTA, and then um, there was the United States Army Marching Ship Unit um, is a place where uh, during the time that I graduated from college, the United States of America dominated Olympic rifle shooting. Okay. And all of our medalists were in the Army and they were stationed at the Army Marching Ship Band. So, because of my credentials in high school and college, um, I was recruited by them and I went to the Marching Ship Unit and, and was able to train. Uh, and I got to, um, 
got good enough to where uh, I made Olympic team in 1972. And my teammate was the best shooter in the world. I've never beaten him. He was he had all the medals and all the credentials. And mm -hmm. I was kind of a new guy. And uh, in rifle shooting, you only know, take two shooters per, per event. So he and I uh, represented the United States in Munich. And um, so I thought, you know, it's possible. My, my practice scores were just as good as his. So I thought, you know, he might choke because, I mean, he's he has a silver medal in previous Olympics. He's a reigning world champion. Everybody expects him to win. Right. So the pressure's always higher on the guy that's supposed to win or the team that's the supposed to win. expectations, yeah. And so uh, nobody no expectations on me. So, uh, you know. Well, I'm back. It's a miracle I'm here at all. Right. Uh, right. And uh, well, he didn't choke, but I did. Oh, okay. And uh, and so I lost more points in the first half of the program than I normally lose in an entire program. And when the pressure was off, in the sense that when I lost so many points I thought I couldn't possibly medal, pressure was off, and I finished up fine enough to get a silver medal. He get my teammate gets a gold medal. But I realized what was wrong with me was that uh, what was missing was I just didn't have the mental skills. The mental skills. Right. And I wanted to know what the winners knew. I didn't. I I, I tried sports psychology and back then. It was really in its infancy, mm -hmm. and um, that really didn't. I didn't find much from that. But what I, what I what really was a game changer for me was when I spent about two years talking on the phone to Olympic gold medalists and world champions to find out what they were doing about the world game. Right. You know, trying to figure out what are the winners now. Now most of these guys, and this is even true today, most most guys who are really at the top of the game are unconscious competent. They they can do it, but they can't really tell you how they're doing it. It's just somehow or other they've got it figured out. Right. And uh, but I kept questions and I started seeing there are patterns to the to what they're doing. And there's the same things that I didn't know mm -hmm. that when I started putting it together, it created a system. And um, I convinced I was actually evidence proof that you can learn to do this. You don't need to be born with it. Just have it. You just have to know what to do. Right. And so um, I put the program together and uh, upgraded to it. Won the world championships next time out, won the gold medal in the Olympics, repeated world champion, pretty much dominated my court, my, my sport for about six years. In the process, I became more and more interested in my game. And uh, not just for me or not just for shooting, but maybe as a as something to do as a thing I love to teach. And so right. I started this company and so we're in our 40th year. Oh wow, really? Uh, we, we teach a lot of different sports. Um we are um, uh, very well represented on the on the PJ Tour on um, uh, on Olympic sports. And number one archer in the world runs our program, and number one street shooter in the world runs our program. So we do a lot with, with shotgun. We do a lot with archery um, and golf, and uh, and other sports too. Team sports too. Although what what I found in a sport, like some sports uh, are are 100% proactive, mm -hmm. and some sports are both proactive and reactive. More like baseball, I think, is both. Um, uh, throwing a pitch is a proactive element. Uh, pitching is a, is a shooting sport. Archery is a shooting sport. Golf is a shooting sport. I yeah, mean, it's a repetitive thing that you can you can do. And uh, uh, but when the ball's in play, it's reactive. Right. So that's a different mental process than like uh, hitting is a little bit unpredictable about what's about to encounter. Yeah, yeah. yeah there, there's uh, hitting is kind of hybrid. And, you mm -hmm. know, it, it's proactive. You can have a physical and mental routine prior to when the pitcher throws the ball at you. Right. But when that ball's coming, I guess it turns into being a little bit reactive. You know, right. So, so, so uh, uh, that's the that that's the case. But there are a lot of things that we teach are, are um, being able to, to define the optimum thing for a player to think about before and after an action. So if the action is hitting or if the action is pitching, um, there are a lot of things that we can do that are just as applicable to a baseball player mm -hmm. as they would be to a tennis player or a golf or, or, the, or, or an archer or anybody else. And, and we teach a lot more golf and archery and Things like that. 
and we didn't like them anymore. But, right. But uh, just because these sports are so big, and baseball uh, is really big, so um, we're very interested in that. But over the years, uh, and I've done a lot of stuff with businesses and corporations and things like that, but but every time when people come to our courses, they always, have, always say the same thing. They said, I wish I'd known this sooner. Right. Well, when, when is sooner? And, and to me, sooner is while you're still at home. Soon as when, I mean, when, when score starts to matter, doesn't the middle game matter then? I mean, you know, if, if there are things that you could do mentally that would, that would make you perform better and improve the probability of winning, wouldn't you want to know about that? And so who, who's, who's supposed to teach that? Right. Yeah. You think the coach, but I mean, you know, that's, I mean, that's the exact reason why I kind of am where I am because I didn't have any of these skills whenever I was playing and in my mind, people have been following it at home, following, uh, following my journey. You know, I shared that, you know, I made it to high levels. I looked like a success to people, but in my own world, I was just, I didn't measure up. I you know, was had the imposter syndrome. Am I good enough? You know what I mean? Do I belong here? And, uh, and, you know, I put this, you know, the program I had together, Bulletproof Hitter is like for, I initially was for guys, high school, college dealing with that. And yet I've kind of found that guys six, seven, eight years old are already, they don't know how to handle the failure. They don't know what to think. And so I'm, I'm interested in what you just said. Uh, Cause the, what I, when I talk to parents, I hear that I don't want to, this is what they're, what the mental thoughts are being said before their performances. I hope I don't screw up. Mm-hmm. I hope I don't strike out. Mm-hmm. I hope I don't get hit by the pitch. Mm-hmm. You know, I just don't want to embarrass myself. You right. know what I mean? And so they have these thoughts and they're there. You know what I mean? Like it would be nice to be the, like you said earlier, the unconscious competent or whatever. You know what I mean? Where you just don't have any thought. But these thoughts are there. So, I mean, what can we replace those with? Like, what do you teach your golfers and your, you know, your the athletes you work with? What's something that they can think of instead of focusing on like this outcome that they may get embarrassed by? Well, what happens when you focus on that? Uh, usually bad things, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so, so, so uh, especially if what you're thinking about in the outcome is the, is the negative outcome. Yeah. You know, the, um, we, we teach that, that performance is a function of three neural processes. Mm-hmm. The conscious mind, what you think about. Right. The subconscious, which is where your skills are. Mm-hmm. And your self-image. Your self-image is your habits and your attitudes is, is, is it's not just what you're thinking about that's conscious. It, 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 is, it is, do you think you can do this? I mean, do you, do you think you can get it in? Right. I mean, is, is it like you to, uh, to be confident about, about this and mm-hmm. the confidence and uh, a lot of things about attitude and uh, or in the self initial thing? And most kids would say, no, I think they come up to the plate and they're hoping to get a hit. They would like to get a hit, mm-hmm. but do they just know that they're, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're they're over trying, they're just wanting to do so well yeah. without sort of trusting that system. Well, what, what happens when you over try? Uh, you just kind of gunk up the system. You're in trouble. You're in trouble. Okay. Yeah. What happens if you have doubt? You're in trouble. You're in trouble. Yeah. All right. So, so, so all of those things is, is to say, well, obviously we don't, we don't want to go there. Mm-hmm. And uh, so what you, you really need is to develop a, uh, a mental process that is helpful instead of harmful. Now, there's, there's, when I use the word routine, I'm talking about what you're physically doing. You have a, you have a, 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 a I guess you could say a, a, a batting routine, you know, when you go up to bat, you know, what right. you're physically doing routine. And, you know, most, most guys are, you, you watch them play a lot, you see that there, there, there's some similarities in what they're doing. They're trying to be uniform. They're trying to stand on the plate in, in, in a uniform way. They tap the bat, they do the batting ball. Yeah. All right. So, so that, that's, that's for uniform. But consistency is a real important part of any kind of sport. Mm-hmm. You know, if you, if you find something that works, wouldn't you want to think, wouldn't you want to do that all the time? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, um, then what well, should be the same thing with, the, with what you're thinking about. Mm-hmm. The problem is that there's a lot of lack of definition in sport, where what I had to do to want to go on the Olympics is I had to find out what's the optimum thing for me to think about before, during, and after a shot. And when I've determined that, the next thing is I need to duplicate that optimal thing all the time, and not just not not just occasionally. See, when I went to when I was in high school and college, all the way up to where I made the Olympic team, uh, I thought about whatever popped into my head. Yeah, there's a variation out of the same. Yeah, yeah. Well, if whatever popped into my head was harmful, 
they've had a harmful result. Right. Yeah. Okay, so 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 I had to determine what what do I want to picture, and then learn to to to, to picture that all the time. Run a little program, if you will. So what was it? What did you say? What did you find was the optimal thing to think about before? What was it well, for you? It, 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 I, I found I found out that I needed to do I needed to do two two things that, that to anticipate. Well, first of all, I had to figure out that everything that, I, that you do in life has three phases to it. It has an anticipation phase where we're preparing to do something. There's an action phase when you're actually doing. As a reinforcement phase, what you think about after you do. Okay. Okay. So if your action phase is really short, like pulling the trigger and the bullet comes out the barrel, mm -hmm. you don't have to think about that because it's too short. But what you think about in preparation, I, br I break it down into, uh, in our system, we break it down into what's called a preload and a middle program. The preload has, has three parts to it. It has strategy. Okay. So tell me a baseball uh, hitter that knows what he's doing doesn't have a little strategy. Yeah. It goes up yeah. Should, should, should be. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm facing a left hander or I'm facing a right hander. If this guy likes to, you know, yeah. if you know something about the pitcher and you're prepared by your, by your coaching staff, Hey, look, you know, the give me balls in the dirt, dirt. Lay off the curve. Or how yeah. about this? The situation in the game. I mean, he, he's going to get a sign. He's going to know. Yeah. You know, all of that stuff. Well, that is, is part of strategy. Got it. Right? All right. So then we, then we teach that it's very important to, to have a commitment step. The commitment step is, is um, uh, I'm, I'm, I have to tell myself, and I did this all, I'm over shot, is I have to remind myself that I can do this. I have to be the commitment step washes out doubt. So you, so you, you're, you're not ever gonna, you know, because you're, you're thinking about being committed to, to what you want to have happen, mm -hmm. and not what you're afraid might happen. So by thinking about what you want to have happen, I think being having a step that says helps you believe and trust that you can do this helps to eliminate that doubt that we don't so want. That's, so that's just a little bit of self-talk. It's just like I can do this. That's right. Got it. That's, right. That, that's what worked for you. And okay. then the third, the, the, the third step is is uh, again yeah, maybe you need to rehearse a little bit. Of what's it going to feel like? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you take a little practice swing at the bar. You know, whatever yeah. you do. Okay. All right. So 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 that's the three parts of of um, of, of the mental program mm -hmm. of, of of the preload. Now, in a golfer, a golfer has a lot of strategy to decide the shot he wanted to make. He takes practice swings. That's the that's the uh, the rehearsal part, mm -hmm. and then he also has a commitment step. So, so you have strategy, rehearsal, commitment for the preload, and then the middle program is the last thing that you're going to last mental pro part of the middle process before the action phase actually starts, and it is and it's always consistent. It's the same all the time. Okay. Now the the, the strategy can vary. You know that it's a variable. Preload is a variable, but but the no program is a constant. It's always the same. Because mm -hmm. what we're trying to achieve is we're trying to get a player to to a to a certain mental state that maximizes the chances that he's going to have a subconscious swing or a subconscious. If he's a golfer or a baseball player, a hitter, he's going to have a, a, a subconscious swing. We're not going to let the conscious mind screw it up. Right. Okay. So. So we, we want to get them to a certain point. So the middle program has two steps. So that is a point of initiation. So at this point, I'm going to start that middle program. It's, uh, there's always a physical trigger that, that starts that. A physical it trigger. Could be a really? breath. It could be a breath. It could be a, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. But it's always the same. The second step is, the second step is called point of alignment. That, that's the last, if he's a hitter, it's the last time he comes back. And he and he's aligned to, to, to receive the, the, the pitch. Okay. okay. Or if he's a rifle shooter, it has to do with putting your head down the stock. And right. Answer. Okay. Then the last thing you think about is point of focus. Well, you should. It, you need to know where those eyes need to go, and they ought to go to the same place all the time. Mm -hmm. And now you can't always control if the pitcher's going to. Throw a pitch or wait a little bit, or some guys take a long time to deliver, or sometimes it's short. So the, the timing of how long you have to work at that spot uh, might vary. And if you don't back away from the plate, uh, next thing that's going to happen is the action's going to start. Right. Okay? So and it depends on, on the shot. Like a golfer, the last look that he has at, at he can, when he, he takes his last look at the target and he comes back, 
when his eyes settle on the ball, he's at what we call point of focus. So that point of initiation, point of alignment, point of focus is uniform all the time. Because if it's not, you don't have no consistency. Right. If you don't give the mind something to think about before before the action, there's a high probability that they're going to think about something negative, which is going to screw them up. Right. But you say, okay, well, that sounds pretty complicated. So how long does it take the guys to do it? I don't know. Eight-year-olds do it a lot better than 58-year-olds do it. Okay. <laughs> well, it seems like the, the key is just not being blown in the wind by your, you know, how you feel today. It's like if you, um, I was reading this the other day, uh, Ryan Holiday, I don't hear what, like ego is the enemy and that sort of thing. Uh, really good stuff. And uh, he had just said something that kind of reminded me of that where he's talking about how um, anxiety can be beaten by systems. You know what I mean? Like if you have a big problem that you're trying to solve, whether it's I need to get a hit or whatever, you know, whatever your problem you're facing, it kind of seems maybe a little daunting. Can I do this? But when you break that down into four or five, six steps, you know, the initiation, the, you know, whatever, it's like having a system in place that you follow. It's like, hey, this is just what I do. I practiced. Step one is my breath. Step two is whatever. You know, when you have steps to take and you do that with consistency, it just eliminates the time. Because that's what I find with the, with the kids that I talk to is just like they're going to think negative unless you fill that time with some, uh, with that focus. You know, Given that conscious mind something to think about other than I hope I don't screw up and get grandma's in the stands and she came in town and I hope I don't strike out in front of her. You know what I mean? And right. so so I think those systems are are pretty key. Well you need to you need to control what you picture. The reason why this is so important is the the thing that I think is left out by a lot of uh, something I didn't know and it was probably the most important thing, the biggest game changer for me as an athlete mm -hmm. that took me from being a really good good guy but not a great guy. Yeah. Uh, was was self image. Uh, self image like if, if if I don't care if you and I are playing golf together and you think you can beat me and I think you can beat me, it's pretty much over for me. Right. You know, a team can have a self image. Well, this team's a lot better than us. Yeah. So, so their level of play drops. Okay. You know, your your, your attitude, your self image about uh, somebody else, or hey, well, this picture's really really bad. You know, I don't want I don't want to face this guy. You right. Know, like, last time I faced him, I, I struck out and I you know, he's throwing like, hard. You know, he's and throwing I can't hard. Get There's a lot of inside shot balls. I might get you all this kind of stuff. So these are creating imprints that improve the probability that that's exactly what you're going to do. So your self image, your your habits and your attitudes, what you think is true is is um, created by imprinting. Now, there are a lot of different kinds of imprints. What you actually do creates an imprint. Like when you uh, when you get a hit, and what imprints is it's like me to get a hit. When you when you strike out, it's like me to strike out. So so that's one form of imprinting. But did you know that if you even think about striking out, you improve the probability of getting it striking out? Yeah, I mean, that sounds about right. You know no, what I mean? That's exactly right. Because what happens is your self-image, just thinking about something, is going to create an imprint. Or worrying about something. It's the same thing. If you worry about, about getting, getting striking out or getting hit by the ball, whatever, you, you just improve the probability that's going to like you to do that. You're going to subconsciously do something. Your subconscious self-image will actually cause you to put yourself in a position to, to create whatever your, your imprint. So I'll tell you what the top 5% do, and, and I study a lot of these guys. Yeah, that's They do 95% of the winning. They, are, they don't talk, they don't think about what they don't want to have happen. They 100% think about what they, what they want to have happen, not what they don't want to have happen. And so, so their self-image is always wrong. When you think about the solution to a problem, your self-image grows. When you think about the problem itself, your self-image shrinks. Okay, so you, you can't think about it. You can't, you don't want to talk about it. You don't want to talk about this stuff. One of, one of the worst things a parent can ask a child when it comes home from a game, our coach can ask them, how would you do? We live in a negatively charged world. The probability that they're going to talk about what went wrong goes way up. Okay. Yeah. So that's what happens. They okay. Talks so, about so, that. so there's a be there are better questions to ask. I'll tell you what I ask my, my players is after every game, when I'm talking to them, I ask them three questions. The first question is, what'd you do right? 
I want them talking about what they've been writing. I want to imprint that. I want them thinking about that. Because every time you talk, think about something, talk about something, write about something, your self-image is growing in that direction. Got it. That's great. So let's think about what you're doing right. The second question I'm going to ask them, because things go wrong. It's a, it's a really good idea that things go wrong. It is. Okay. Because if, they, if things never went wrong, if they always went right, how, what would you learn? You wouldn't learn anything. Right. Okay. okay. So, so, but the key is it's not a mental error to, to, to make a mistake. It is a mental error to make a mistake and not learn anything from it. Mm-hmm. So my que- second question to them is, what did you learn? Okay. Okay. I mean, it's, a, it's important that people, that people well, not fail, but they, it's important that people err. Right, because if you learn from what you what you your errors, that's how you grow. As a matter of fact, um, learning from mistakes is is not is not only not a bad thing; it's a requirement. Mm-hmm. I can't every champion that I've ever worked with, yeah, they would all agree with me. They said, "Well, how did you get so good?" Well, I I made a lot of mistakes and I learned from them. Right, I mean, that's the most common thing that the top people say. Okay, interesting. So then the final thing I would say, you know, I would ask them is, what are you going to do about it? I mean, is, is this going to build you or break you? I mean, that's a, that's a choice. So so there's no such thing as failure in, in, in baseball. Mm-hmm. You know? it's, it, it's, it's, there's no such fail, thing as failure in tennis or golf or anything like that. The only two things can happen though, in, in, to, a, to an athlete. They can, they, can, they can win or they can win. Okay. They're, they're from winning and losing. If, if, if losing is a choice, it, it, it's a choice that people make if they if they want to never reach the top of their potential. So what we try to teach kids to do and parents to do is, I think all parents are interested in, in helping their children reach the top level of their potential. No doubt. So you have to control the imprinting of the kids and letting them talk about. What, what they did wrong without talking about a solution is is taking you in the wrong wrong direction. Well, you were you you played well last week. Why didn't you play well this week? Yeah. Why'd you drop that fly ball? You had to yeah. go right behind you. That's yeah, we worked on thing, that. That's a thing for mom and dad to say. <laughs> yeah, and it's good intentions. Everybody wants their kid to do well. And yeah. uh, you said something before we started this that you know you deal with you know athletes of all levels. You know what I mean? High school age. And a lot of it is fixing damage that was inflicted by the parents. And again, it's not like it's easy to be like, oh, the parent that's trying to get their kid, you know what I mean, that pro contract into college. And what I found, that's really not what people are really wanting. It, you know, maybe some people are really wanting that for their kid, but most, most they just want their kid to play to their potential. And the kid's not, and he's, you know, not applying his practice, you know, whatever. And so it's frustrating. It was good intentions, but it came out wrong. And so um, tell me a little bit about the, the damage from parents that you're saying, what can they do better than uh, to ask some questions? It's amazing. Well, I've, I've spent the last two years of my of my life writing a book called Parenting Champions. Okay. And uh, Parenting Champions is all about all the mistakes I made as a parent because I didn't know this stuff. I mean, I learned a lot of this stuff after uh, my kids were, were you know, preteens, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, and, 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 and teenagers, and so. Um, I, 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 I have made every mistake that I'm trying to correct by this book. But what we really have to have to look at is that is, book. Is that book complete, by the way, or is it? Sure, it's ready to buy. Because I, I hadn't heard that. I'll, I'll put a link to that on this thing. That would be very, very it's interesting. So. It is out. And um, so the, the the purpose of the book is to empower parents. Because what the, the first question that, that I ask in the book to parents is is let me, let me ask you a question. You're a parent, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, so let me yeah. ask you a question. Which, what's, what's more important to you? Uh, what your children accomplish or who they become? Oh, uh, yeah, who they become. Yeah, no no doubt. Right. Well, that's really interesting because the world doesn't care who they become. They, they, they only care. Accomplishment is what is rewarded. Mm-hmm. Accomplishment always has a score, a score associated with it. It's how many runs you get at the, uh, in a ball game. It's how many votes you get in an election. It's how much money you make. It's A, B, C, B, F in school. It's gold, silver, bronze, and the Olympics. So there's plenty of ways to reward uh, accomplishment. But it's very, very difficult to reward becoming. 
Okay. The coming is is how do you how do, how do you measure confidence? How do you measure character? How do you measure trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, right. brave, clean, whatever how you voice that? So you can remember that song. But so, so what what I'm trying to get parents to see is that that the most that becoming is really important. The other issue that I make is that um, you ask me, Olympic athlete, any PGA Tour player, anybody at the top level of their game, I would imagine most most top baseball players. Although we we only coach to a couple of guys that are Triple A guys, we don't. We, we have we have one guy that Troy, my son Troy is coaching right now that, that's 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 playing uh, in, in the majors, but okay. just moved up. Okay. They kind of move up and down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, uh, so his picture. So we um, we we ask the, these these you ask any any top performer in any in any Olympic sport for sure. What percentage of your game is mental? And you get a big number back. The number we get most often is my sports 90% mental. And then you say, okay, that's interesting. So since you've been doing this, how much percentage of your time, money, and effort have you spent on the mental game? <laughs> and, and, and the number goes like 1%. Yeah, right? like one, one's generous. Yeah. 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 And so, so that there's something wrong with that with that situation. Right. Uh, for, for example, we're sitting here in, in Flower Mound, Texas, and you don't have to go very far. You know, Marcus High School or a Flower Mound High School or Louisville or any, any, any of these schools, ton big schools, they all have baseball teams, they all have basketball teams, they all have football teams, they all have golf teams, they all have about a bunch of, some of them have swimming teams and lacrosse and all kinds yeah. of things. All right. And all of those, all those programs have coaches. Okay. How many, how many of those schools have a known coach? I would guess zero. I yeah, yeah, I, there is not, yeah I, I, I pretty much guarantee you there's not, a, especially in public school, there's not a, not a middle, co middle coach. And there's very few middle coaches in college. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you say, well, well, that might explain why they, they, don't, they don't know if there's, no, there's not enough middle coaches. But if you think that there's not a lot of middle coaches around, you'd be wrong. Mm -hmm. Because I'll tell you, the most important middle coach that any child ever had is the parent of the girl that drives them home from the game. Right. And 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 I we don't have a lack of middle coaches. Every every coach, every one of those coaches that that are all those teams are middle coaches. Every parent is a middle coach. The problem is they're not trained to be one. Right. They haven't had enough training, and that that is exactly what a big focus of our company today is that to to empower parents and we, we start out by, by okay read this book you know a lot of times books are a very economical way to, to get information right now that's not going to fix the, the, the problem entirely but it will make them aware mm -hmm. of the fact that you know what you may be the problem yeah you don't even know right of what you're what you're doing but um so what we try to do is, is I've tried to distill the areas that are most d d alarming for, for me when I'm working with parents. Because what typically happens when we work with kids below 18, we always have their parents come in. We train the parent at the same time we train the kid. Because okay. we know that the parent's the one that really should be teaching the mental skills. Not not so much us. Not certainly if they have coaches. You know, if they're playing in the league and they've got guys that that, that are coaching their team, they are em empowering them as well. Uh -huh. But but no question about it, the parent is the most important middle coach uh, until the kids get to be about uh, about ready to graduate. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah no doubt. All right. And then and then. About ninety percent of the of, of the damage has already been done, or ninety percent of the good has already been been invested in, in the kids and what they're going to do for the rest of their lives. So it's 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 a it's an extremely important role that parents play, and I don't think they realize that they are actually executing and making a difference uh, with their children in something that. Later on in their life, they may look back and say, "This is this is one of the most important times I ever had in my life. I was either I was either helped or all harmed." And so we are trying to take everything that we've learned and and get it down because people earlier rather than later, because most of the time 
people say, well, you don't need to worry about the no game until you've got a high uh, ability of form. You know, you're he looks like he's going to go to college and yeah, he's got yeah. some aptitude. Well, that's, that, nothing can be further from the truth. Right. We te- can teach parents mental skills and coaches mental skills that they can teach early that can, can eliminate, that will do two things for them. It will make learning for them faster. And it will give them more confidence and consistency in terms. Oh, wow. Hold that thought right there. Let me plug this, this uh, computer in here. Make sure we don't lose this. This is good stuff. We've got a few more minutes, and then we'll wrap it up. But, let, me uh, go, let me go get a copy of that book so we can show the book. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, let's see. we got plenty of plenty right there. Hang with me, Facebook. We'll be right back. All right, cool. I didn't want that to cut out on us there. If you guys have any questions, you're watching this right now, go ahead and click. Um, we might be able to get to one or two before we let Lanny go. Um, so anyway, really, really good stuff. But um, you know, oh, he's got that book here. So here's the one that I read with winning in mind. Very, very good. And then uh, what do you got here with the parenting champions? Lanny Bash, I got his boys right there. Yeah. I'm assuming those are your sons. That's, that's an old that's picture of you guys there. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's fantastic. So. So you mentioned that asking a kid, one of the worst things you can do is asking them, you know, how they do. Right. Is this about to go negative? Um, what's one other one? Is there another one that you can think of for a parent? Just a, a quick, a quick little takeaway of something that you see them doing wrong on a consistent basis. Well, the, the most important thing for parents to understand is imprinting. They need to understand that the, their ch- your child's self-image is is either growing or shrinking based on what they're thinking about, talking about, writing about. Mm-hmm. Okay, and doing. All right. So, so you want them thinking about what they want to have happen all the time, or you want them thinking about the solution to problems, not the problem itself. Okay. Now, sometimes it, because just remember this, if every time you're thinking about the problem, your their self-image, every time they're thinking about the problem, talking about the problem, worrying about the problem, their self-image is shrinking. Mm-hmm. They're becoming what they're worrying about. Okay. Every time they're thinking about the solution to the problem, their self image is actually growing. Mm-hmm. So it's not a problem to make to make a mistake. It's a problem, not it's not an error to make a mistake. It's a no error to, to not learn from that, not to not to understand it. So when when parents are talking to the kids, most kids don't because they don't know to do this. The top five percent in the world, or I'll tell you what they're doing all the time. They're thinking about what they did right. They're reinforcing that. They're thinking about it. They're talking about it. They're, they're, they're writing about it. They're reinforcing the success that they have. Mm-hmm. Okay? People in the middle of the leaderboard are ignoring that. Okay, so they, you get a hit. Okay, that feels good, but that's the last time you think about it. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm only thinking about it a lot. If you want to hit, get, get a lot of hits, if you want to be likely to get a lot of hits, you, every time you get a hit or hit a home run, you should be thinking about that. You should be writing it down in a journal. We teach them how to do it. Keep a performance journal. They're writing down what they learned. They're writing down what they did right. People, no, most people don't do that. Well, now I'm sorry. Uh, so what we're so what would you suggest for somebody who? Because we we get that. I got a guy. He emailed me the other day. He said his kid hit went like four for six on double header, had two triples. But on the ride home, all he could talk about was the foul tip strike three that the catcher caught. That he thought the catcher dropped it. Yeah, you know I mean he couldn't get off of the one mistake he basically made all day long. And so, you know, focusing on, on the success is easy, um, but we do, do have kids, you know, pretty common. I mean, if you play long enough, this will happen to you or your son where you go hitless, no game, you know, uh, hitless for a weekend, hitless for, you know, you're one for 15, one for 20. I mean, if you've had a lack of success to draw back on, is it just, you know, you're, you're focusing on the solutions and, you know, it's, you know, you, you get no hits the next game too. Is it just a consistency and staying with it? How do we build the self-image when you're in a cold streak and you don't have a lot of success to, to draw on, at least in a recent future? What would you recommend to someone well, like that? Okay, I'll tell you what. The quickest way to, to fix that is if if you if you we teach we teach parents how to teach the kids how to journal, how to create a, a, a journal, a okay. performance journal, okay? And we have a performance journal that we sell here. And so if 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 every time that they had a good game, 
they were documenting what they did right, how it felt, um, and, and maybe even do a little bit of audio. You know, now everybody's got an audio voice recorder on their phone. Right. So, so okay, and every, all kids have phones. So, so okay, I hit a voice recorder. Boy, he, here's how I feel right now, boy, up to this game, and here's how that, that shot felt like, and here, here's how it all went. And so, and if, if they can write that down and, and maybe do a little audio and keep those in a way that you, it's easier to, easy to find, Mm-hmm. And now you have a cold streak where things aren't going well. The quickest way to break that is to go back and review what you wrote and what you said when things were going good. Okay, that's the fastest way to break. That's what the pros do. That's what the that's what the, the, the Olympic athletes do. But if you don't document that, mm-hmm. you, you 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 start thinking you never had a good day. Right. Forget so what that, we teach, forgetting what that felt we like, teach yeah. them. We teach people to journal every day. Now, some days, bad tournaments. The reason why you're having four or five bad tournaments in a row is because you're not learning. When you make a mistake, you're not learning the solution to fixing that. It's not. It's not sticking. And maybe one of the reasons it's not sticking is that is that when you learn something, you're not writing down what you learned. And so by by reinforcing Parents are enforcing, coaches are enforcing. When I run my international shooting school, I wouldn't coach a kid if he didn't keep a journal. And, and what we had was, um, we were putting people at, on national teams, we were putting people at state championships, things like that, over and over again, faster than anybody else was doing. We had better, we had better tools. Mm-hmm. We, we told them, okay, it, it, how long does it take? I'm not interested in giving them extra homework. If you, you can do journaling correctly in five to ten minutes, and most of the time, the only reason it would take ten minutes is you had a really good day and you want to write a lot more. And if you and if you had a bad day, do you journal? Absolutely. You know, you, have, you, you, you journal. You, we, we teach them to journal, journal after every every practice, uh-huh. after every tournament. It's something you do at the end of the at the end of practice. What did I learn today? What did I do well today? What am I going? And and just a couple of sentences. It's all we all we got. But if you have a really good good tournament or uh, performance, you you want to write that down. You want to you want to repeat that. And so you want, that's what you do. But if if you don't ever have a journal, right, you don't have that to go back to. Mm-hmm. And some guys are more video, are more audio oriented than they are visual oriented. And and they they're good talkers, but they're not good writers. Right. Okay. Now I would love for them to do both. Right. But if if you can only get them to do one, then here's what you do. You say turn on the the uh, uh, voice recorder, and mom turns on her voice recorder and says, okay. And here's what the kid says. He says, what I did well today was, and whatever comes out of his mouth is okay. Yeah, doesn't matter. Uh-huh. If he wants to talk a lot, fine. But uh-huh. it's always he's talking about what he did right. He tied he, his he, shoes he, right he, today. He that was about it. That's, yeah, that's golden. <laughs> that's golden, right? Right. And then, and then uh, what I learned today was sometimes he can't think of anything. But well, sometimes if he didn't have a good day, he, he, he says, "Well, I, I did this. Well, what's the solution to that?" Mm-hmm. You know, parents get him back to the solution. Solution. Okay, what are you going to do about it? Well, I'm going to practice more. Well, I'm going to learn how to do this. I'm, there's, a, there's a guy on my team that knows how to do it right. I'm going to talk to him more than one. Okay, great. That, that, that's golden. Right, do that. Yeah. Yeah, and I've heard that. Um, I've heard so many people talk about the magic of journaling. You know what I mean? Not, you know, just in uh, getting your thoughts out. Just in so many, you know, there's probably 18 different benefits of it. And I'm guilty of it. I don't do it. I, I did it for a while. It's one of those things you can kind of get out of practice with. Oh, you know sure. I mean? And, um, but yeah, it's about writing down your thoughts and, and even like your fears because sometimes you build up these fears of like if I have this bad game and you start to respond in a way it's like you know like a fight or flight syndrome like this is the biggest deal and once you kind of write out your thoughts how you're feeling you kind of see it and it just sort of takes the teeth out of it a little bit oh, and uh, go from there but um, no this has been fantastic you have anything you'd like to before we I'll be respectful of your time here well I, I'm just I'm just uh, I'm excited that you're doing this I didn't know you were doing this but uh, I'm, I'm just telling you that I, I think that the the training paradigm that we have had for years is obsolete. Uh, we, we are 
the middle game is, is, is everybody at the top level thinks it's the most important thing. And it's, 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 I understand why the middle game is not taught as much as form for a couple of reasons. First, first of all, form is easier to teach. Right. The middle game is not so easy to teach. Uh, secondly, it requires, the middle game requires a, a desire on the part of, of the person that you're teaching to want to get better mentally. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you have to motivate them how, how important what you're thinking about in your self image is. And the, the other major reason is there haven't, we haven't had a good curriculum to, to, to teach you. How parents are going to know about what to teach? How, how are coaches supposed to know about what to teach? There hasn't been a good curriculum. Right. And, and it's easy to video, it's easy to video skills. So there's tons of videos on how to get, how to pitch, how to do all that kind of stuff. But tell me, give me, give me some videos on, on how to improve confidence and what you should really think about. And there, it, you need to talk about, talk to people. They need to understand concepts. There need to be principles. And, and so what we've done for the last 40 years in all management is we've tried to make something that could be pretty complex. And the sports psychologists tend, tend to make it sound complex. Yeah, like the big words. And yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we, we've, we've uh, um, simplified all the important stuff. And er we don't teach anything in no management. We don't teach anything that won't work at the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And if it will work, if it won't, it will work anyway. And it's, you have a huge example, advantage living locally. We have, uh, as a matter of fact, tomorrow, I'm, I'm in production tomorrow for a parenting class, uh, a local parenting class program. It's like a three hour uh, session. Parents can turn it, it's going to be very, very economical for them to come. I would say start out reading the book and then uh, try to come to the training classes, if you will. And, and then we, we, we do the same thing for, for coaches. So we have coaching programs that coaches can come in and learn about how to, how to implement this, uh, what we've learned. Right. And, um, and so, um, come, come talk to us at, at um, uh, mentalmanagement.com. Yeah, no, cool. We'll put links to all that. Uh, these books are fantastic, guys. I, I haven't read this one. I'm going to check this one out um, ASAP. And uh, the journal thing, you said you sell journals too? Oh, yeah. I'm going to get some of those. Journals so. in seven colors. Oh, and awesome. We're I gonna... can't believe it. you can get a kid to journal if it's, if it's got the right color of journal. Uh, I know, know, right? All in color. I don't want to do it. Man, I'm not doing anything red. red. You know, okay. Yeah, that's man. That's so like cool. my band aids. That's at our house, oh, man. You give them a brown right. band aid, they have no business for it. Put a, put a page, what's that, uh, Dora the Explorer or somebody on there, man. They're just like band-aids all over the place, right. you know, so That's it's right. like so it's, whatever. And you make it fun. I mean, it, 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 <laughs> we, we, we try to make everything we do fun. I mean, that's a real key to use if, if they don't they don't want they don't want to do something that's painful. So Yeah. Um, is this it right here? Yeah, I see these colors. Yeah, yeah, yeah is it here? some of them, yeah. I'll show it to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to buy some here. I'll wrap one off to you guys. Put your name in here, and we'll, uh, we'll get you guys some of these books. I'm journaling. Uh, sounds you got I'll start doing it we'll do it together you know what I mean it'll be a fun deal so um, anyway Lanny appreciate it so You're much welcome. for all the time so uh, all right Facebook we'll be we'll be talking to you soon all right click that like button if you enjoyed it and uh, I'll be talking to you guys soon thanks a lot